Well, we began a Bible study through the letter of 1 Thessalonians last time, and we got through the first chapter. In the opening chapter of this letter, Paul talks about the beautifully transformed lives of the believers in Thessalonica who had embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ and then allowed the Holy Spirit to change them. And word about what the Lord was doing in their lives, said, they said, was ringing out all over the place. Not only in Macedonia, but throughout the Roman Empire, word was being shared about what was happening there. Well, today in the second chapter of 1 Thessalonians, Paul is going to talk about the use and the abuse of privilege, power, and authority. Paul is going to talk about these things as they related directly and personally to himself and the people in the church at Thessalonica. But we'll be able to draw application for our own lives from his example. This topic touches all of our lives on some level, doesn't it? I mean, almost all of us have or will have at some time some kind of privilege, power, or authority over someone else. It might be a parent, a teacher, a boss. You're a leader of some kind in some kind of context. And the attitudes and the principles that we observe in this passage of Scripture, they can be applied in almost any area where we will hold a place of privilege, power, or authority over others. The key teaching on this topic for followers of Jesus can be found over in Mark chapter 10, verse 42 through 45, where it said that Jesus, he called them, his disciples together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. In the world we live in, those with privilege, power, and authority cling to it. And they create systems to protect it and maintain it. And they use it to benefit themselves, firstly, even at the expense of those underneath them. In the kingdom of God, under Jesus, it's not supposed to work like that, though. Instead, the ones with privilege, power, authority are to use it to serve those in their charge, protecting, providing for, and benefiting them even at their own expense. We're told to follow the example of Jesus who did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So, 2 Thessalonians, or I mean 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I knew I was going to get that switched around. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. In this chapter, Paul is defending himself and those with him against accusations being made that they were not to be trusted, that they were trying to take advantage and to rip off the people of Thessalonica, that they were just like the other charlatans and swindlers and frauds that made their lives living, traveling from town to town, selling their stories and their claims of hidden truths and discoveries, preying on the gullible and the weak-minded. The people instilling these accusations against Paul were probably the same people who had instigated the mob riots that got him and Silas driven out of Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17. It was a group of Jews in that city who were very jealous of Paul. After leaving Thessalonica, Paul and Silas went further west, about 40 miles to the city of Berea, and they began preaching about Jesus there. And you might remember that Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, said that the Jews in Berea were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. And as a result, many of them believed. Well, the Jews of Thessalonica, they hated Paul so much that when they heard that Paul and Silas had gone to Berea and they were 
teaching about this Jesus there, they went to Berea and they instigated crowds against them, forcing Paul and Silas to leave Berea as well. This same group of people have apparently continued to do whatever they can to discredit and malign Paul in Thessalonica, and they have instigated persecutions against the new Christians in their city. This has motivated Paul to present a defense of his ministry and methods in this letter and to strengthen and encourage the Thessalonian believers in the things that they believed. Paul begins by reminding the Thessalonian believers of those first days that he was with them. You know, when we find our minds swirling and questioning and doubting, it's good to just step off that merry-go-round and remind ourselves of those early days when we came to faith in Jesus, where we were at, what we were like at that time, what he did for us, where he's brought us from that point. And this is, in effect, what Paul is doing here in 1 Thessalonians. Beginning in the first verse, he says, You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was without... You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. Paul reminds them of the impact that his visit to Thessalonica had on their lives. He says, look at your own lives and the change that God has done in you. You know from firsthand experience that we're not frauds. Paul had not come riding into Thessalonica making a bunch of wild claims like some snake oil salesman and then ridden off into the sunset with his pockets full of their money having swindled them. Instead, he shared with them the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. They believed and the Lord changed their lives in a profound and real way. Paul reminds them in the second verse, about how he came to Thessalonica and how he was treated when he got there. He says, we had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. They had been treated outrageously, it says in Philippi. Paul was a legitimate Roman citizen, which gave him certain rights and protections under Roman law. But in Philippi, he and Silas had been stripped and beaten with rods in the public square and then put in prison with their feet fastened in stocks. That kind of treatment was never to be done to a Roman citizen, especially without due process to determine their guilt or innocence. Their rights had been terribly violated. Well, when Paul and Silas got to Thessalonica, they encountered a great deal of opposition from this group in the Jewish community. But despite the troubles that they face in Philippi and then again in Thessalonica, he says, with the help of God, we dare to tell you the gospel. And the Lord was faithful, doing great work, changing their lives. He says, for the appeal we made does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. Paul makes three points of defense here. First, their appeal or their message, their teaching, their preaching. It didn't spring from error. It was true. It was the truth. It comes from very God rather than being something that Paul had made up in his own mind or been some accumulation of good advice collected from wise people throughout the ages. We often refer to the content of the Bible and the message about God and Him rescuing humanity through Jesus Christ as the Word of God. Why? Because we believe it is the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that all Scripture is God-breathed or inspired by God. In 2 Peter 2.21, it tells us that men were carried along by the Holy Spirit as they recorded the Scriptures. Paul didn't make up the gospel out of his own mind. He received it directly from Jesus Christ. It tells us in Galatians 1, 11 through 2, 10, where he relates the story of his conversion and how Jesus came to him and Jesus himself taught him this gospel that he now preaches throughout the Roman world. It's this same gospel that the other apostles were also teaching and preaching 
they had gotten it firsthand from Jesus. It's interesting to know that there are nine different authors in the books of the New Testament, and they all tell the same gospel message about Jesus being the Christ who came to save us from our sin and death. Well, second, Paul and those with him, they didn't tell the Thessalonians about Jesus with impure motives. And third, they were not trying to trick the Thessalonians. Paul was not seeking to deceive them. They were honest, operating with, to use a modern term from our day, with full disclosure. Verse 4, on the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. So Paul, he now begins elaborating and expanding on what he had said in verse 3. Rather than an erroneous message with impure motives and deception, they are approved by God and entrusted by God with a message from God, the gospel. You might remember the movie The Blues Brothers with Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi and their characters in that film popularized the line, we're on a mission from God. Well, Paul and Silas, they really are on a mission from God. Convinced that he was truly on a mission from God gave Paul the courage and the integrity to do what he was doing the way he was doing it. Think about your own life for a moment. What kind of impact would it have on what you do and how you do it if you were convinced that you were on a mission from God? You and I can truly be on a mission from God, you know. We've been called to follow Jesus Christ and to serve him with our lives in everything we do in life. We have the opportunity to be on a mission from God in all that we're doing. Colossians 3.17, for example, it says, Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him, or what." Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all as though you were on a mission from God in the name of Jesus Christ. Think about your job, your chores, your responsibilities, your assignments, your obligations of whatever they are in life. How can you do those things in such a way that they're being done in the name of the Lord Jesus being done in such a way that they honor Jesus, being done in such a way that they can be seen as a mission from God. Remember who we are ultimately serving and who we are ultimately seeking to please. We ought to be living our lives as though we are on a mission from God. He says, we're not trying to please people but God who tests our hearts. Although Paul is seeking to serve people, he is not trying to please people. And there's a big difference. God is the one he's seeking to please. It's God's mission. It's his agenda that Paul is seeking to follow, not people's. God is the one Paul is ultimately accountable to, the authority that he's ultimately under. Being a people pleaser rather than a God pleaser, it corrupts our motives. We can start playing favorites with people and doing things for personal gain and reward. Being a people pleaser rather than a God pleaser can make us <clears throat> do things from a place of fear rather than from a place of faith. We can take on too much responsibility for the success or the failure of the thing, and that can start to really stress us out. Being a people pleaser rather than a God pleaser, it knocks us off our mission. We can start doing things that people want us to do, which may not be what God wants us to do. Jesus tells us to concern ourselves with pleasing God rather than people. Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, taking out of context, that sounds unbelievably harsh, doesn't it? 
But in the context that Jesus said it, he was talking about not being afraid of those who are against Jesus. And in the very next sentence, he reminds us of how precious and greatly loved we are by God our Father. When we make pleasing God our central aim, we will be serving and caring for people in the best way possible, and we will have pure motives doing it. Verse 5, you know, we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. Flattery can be a powerful tool in the hands of a person with ulterior motives, can't it? We're all suckers for a good compliment and being told what we want to hear. And a person who can take advantage of that, they have a powerful tool. Paul didn't use flattery. He saw it as dishonest and deceitful. We're cautioned many times in Scripture about greed, dishonest gain, the love of money. If we allow greed to become a motive in our life, we have stepped into a very dark and dangerous place. There is tremendous amount of self-deception wrapped up in greed that can lead us to do unthinkable things. Paul warns Timothy and those that Timothy teaches in 1 Timothy 6, 9 about this. He says, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Verse 6, we're not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. He says we're not, we were not looking for praise from people. This is a, another way of saying that they had pure motives, that they sought to please God rather than people, that they didn't use flattery on others or pay attention to the flattery that others were heaping on them. When we're looking for the praise of people rather than the praise of God, we've put a tremendous amount of power and influence over us into the hands of someone who can forget, who can change their mind, who can be petty and selfish, even hate us and seek our demise. Our Heavenly Father loves us and always has the best intentions for us. He can always be trusted. Live for His praise rather than the praise of people. Paul finishes this paragraph with more evidence of the purity of his motives. See, even though Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ, he didn't use the privilege and the authority that comes with that position. Instead, he was humble, like a young child, he said, among the Thessalonians. Young children in those days, in that culture, they had no rights. They were the bottom of the pile in regards to rights and privileges. When Paul says he was like a young child among them, he's saying that he took a very low position among them. It speaks a powerful uh, message when a leader chooses to take a lower place than they have a right to. And at the same time, a leader who is always quick to take everything that their position affords them, it reveals themselves as very self-centered. The leader who rolls up their sleeves and gets down into the muck with everyone else, it makes an impression they're acting like Jesus because that's how he did it, setting aside his godness and living like one of us in order to help us, in order to save us. The boss who's always taking full advantage of the privileges of their position, it leaves a bad taste in the mouth of their subordinates, doesn't it? I've had both kinds of authorities over me, and the ones I remember fondly are those who got down into the trenches with me.
Verse 7, the second part of that verse says, Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Paul didn't just roll into town, preach a few sermons, lead a few Bible studies, and then move on to the next place. That wasn't how he he operated. Look at the terms of affection in these sentences. He says, as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. We loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you our lives. See, Paul didn't just do his job. He shared his life with these people. Verse 9. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. Paul and those with him, it says they worked hard day and night, supporting themselves financially while they were in Thessalonica. See, even though being supported financially by the people in the church would have been completely, entirely acceptable, Paul chose to support himself while he was there so he would not be a burden to them. Paul did this in some of the other places that he had worked as an evangelist too, such as Corinth. A couple of the reasons that Paul has given for why he did this is he did it so that his motives for why he was preaching the gospel would not be questioned. And he did it to be an example for those to follow who are there in the church to see that working to earn one's living is the way we are to behave. Over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, which is his second letter to this same church, he writes this in verse 7. He says, For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to anyone. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this role, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. What kind of work did Paul do to support himself financially? Well, we know that he had been trained as a tent maker. (coughs) That's (coughs) <coughs> Excuse me. That's probably the kind of work that he did. He made and repaired tents and perhaps other similar things. Tents in those days were made out of leather rather than the high-tech fabrics that we use in our own day. And so he was apparently very skilled in leather work, in creating, building, constructing, designing these tents And that was a highly skilled position in those days. I'm sure that he could go into that area of the town where the manufacturing and the repair of these kinds of things were done. And he could then pick up a few days work uh, (coughs) given that he had skill in this area. Back over 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 10. So as your witnesses, and so is God of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. In other words, they knew the kind of lives that Paul and those with him lived. They were the real deal. They lived what they were preaching and teaching. Christian, it's important that we live lives of integrity, lives that are consistent with the Jesus and the Bible that we claim to follow, right? I mean, what Paul said to the Thessalonians was received by them because his life was consistent with the words that he spoke. His life and his words were saying the same thing. If we want to be listened to, we need to be saying the same thing with our life and with our words. There's so few people in our day who live consistently with their words. I mean, everyone seems to have something to say posting their amazing wisdom and insights and opinions and judgments on social media about anything and everything that they claim to be an expert on, which is virtually everything. 
but there are a tragic few who live by their words. Let's you and I be among those few who do. 11. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Again, we see this tender heart of Paul that he has for these people. He dealt with them like they were his own children, encouraging them, comforting them, urging them to live lives consistent with the things that they were now believing about God and their salvation. 13, and we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. As we noted earlier in verse 3, the words about Jesus spoken by Paul, they're not just some stuff that he had thought up in his head or a collection of wise words handed down through the ages from people. It was the very word of God, and the Thessalonians received it as the word of God. It says, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. The Greek word translated work is the word energeo or energio, which we get the English word energy from. The word of God is full of energy at work in those who believe. Hebrews 4, 12, it says the word of God is alive and active. That same Greek word, energeo, appears here and is translated as active in Hebrews 4, 12. Martin Luther said, the Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet. It runs after me. It has hands. It takes hold of me. As an illustration of the active living energy of the Word of God, you'll remember in the very first sentences of the Bible, God spoke the creation into existence. That same alive, living, active, energetic Word of God is working in our lives too. Finally, it says, for you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. So Paul encourages the believers in the Thessalonian church who are themselves facing persecution for their faith in Jesus. Paul tells them that they're not alone in their suffering. What they're going through is the same thing that their brothers and sisters in the churches in Judea have suffered. In fact, Unbelieving Jews, like these people that they're facing, were responsible for killing Jesus, Paul says, and the prophets of the Old Testament. And they drove Paul and his companions out of the city. They are hostile toward anyone seeking to share the message of salvation with people outside of their own circle, i.e. the Gentiles. And for what they've done for centuries... And are continuing to do, he says, the wrath of God is going to come upon them. Paul's words to the Thessalonian Christians here reminds us of similar words that Peter spoke to the believers in his first letter, where he writes in 1 Peter 4.12, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in so much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. 
So in closing, I, I just want to give us a very quick summary of these attitudes and principles that we observe in Paul in this passage for how to use privilege, power, and authority. First, tell the truth. Operate with pure motives. Don't deceive. Be honest. See your life as a mission from God. Be a God pleaser rather than a people pleaser. Don't use flattery to manipulate people. Beware of greed. Don't use the advantage of your privilege, power, and authority to benefit yourself. Instead, use it to help others. Don't just do your job. Share your life. Be an example others can follow. Live by the words you say. Let the word of God work in your life. And finally, be an encourager. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. And then we'll close with worship. Father, we thank you for Paul's example that we have here in this chapter of how to use privilege, power, and authority that is given to us. Lord, we pray that we would follow the example of our Lord Jesus. That we would seek to give our life for the benefit of others. That we would seek to serve others. Use that which you've entrusted us with to bless and to help. In Jesus' name, amen.